Welcome to this episode of American Hysteria's Context Clues, where I, your host, Chelsea Weber-Smith, share some sections from previous topics we've covered over the years that will hopefully make richer our next series on Hallmark Christmas Movies. This winter season, it seems like everyone is talking about the joy and the folly of the cheesy, oversaturated, made-for-TV Christmas movie market. Of course, there are those from the royal crowned head of Hallmark, but now they're also churned out from Lifetime, Netflix, and, it seems, every single other streaming service that I subscribe to. When it comes to these movies, it's hard to avoid a basic understanding of how these stories work with their unceasingly formulaic plots. A big city career woman with an inattentive boyfriend and a distaste for the holiday season finds herself by some small misfortune in a small town where she meets a handsome, blue-collar, sensitive man who revives her Christmas spirit, leading her to taper down her career ambitions and focus on what really matters. Many people sincerely love these movies because they are always warm and comforting. Everything always works out in the end, and everything is always chaste. Usually only one quick kiss at the end. Often followed by some secondary character shooting into the sky because he's Santa and everyone finds out that magic is real, after all. Others of us love them purely for their corny, almost campy nature. Something to quote to our friends, something to make drinking games about. While we too sit back to enjoy these little drag shows of the American dream. But they bring us joy, just like they do to those who watch them more sincerely, somehow gifting us with a gayer version of the Christmas spirit by celebrating the transcendent magic of entertainment so bad that it's good. And you know, underneath that, some of us might like to live in a nice, friendly little small town sometimes, too. These movies have been a serious staple of the holiday season, with Hallmark premiering nine brand new made-for-TV movies in 2009. By 2017, that number would jump to 33. This year, they are producing over 40, and that is just Hallmark alone. But along with their massive success over the last two decades, the company has recently found themselves in snow-meltingly hot water, as controversies have swirled around their lack of representation of everyone who isn't white, Christian, and straight. The poster child for the controversy is a very familiar 90s sitcom child star turned Christian influencer and Starkist Tuna spokesperson, Hallmark's former tree-topping star, who just jumped sleigh to the far more conservative Great American Family Channel. The Great American Family Channel has said that they're going to keep their focus on traditional marriage and stories that include an outspoken Christian message in a way that Hallmark doesn't quite. But one thing these networks all agree on is that Santa Claus is a far more neutral, supernatural, secular saint, and it's always a good idea to jam him into your plot anytime you can. But this Santa guy, who has become a kind of veritable American god, once represented more of a threat than a treat. 
Just like today, right-wing zealots all the way back to the 1930s have been sounding the alarm about the secularization of Christ's birthday. And they've been trying to protect the purity of the season from the very dramatic, definitely not made up, war on Christmas. Here's the excerpt. This easy, secular Santa continued to rise in popularity, and by the 1930s, he was everywhere. He was the feature of the Ladies' Home Journal. He was the popular icon of Coca-Cola's Christmas ad campaign. In addition to his rise into the lord of capitalism, Santa was becoming a symbol of the power of children's innocence and imagination that was sweeping the culture after even the poorest children got their labor rights, no longer forced to work in the factories of the Industrial Revolution, something we cover in detail in our Satanic Panic series. The family unit was influenced by the artistic movement of romanticism, and children, especially those of the rich, became precious and almost doll-like, in need of careful sheltering, and in need of a new, more huggable religious figure. And of course, a sweeter Judgment Day. But this secular Santa really rattled more Orthodox Christians, who accused him of trying to replace Jesus Christ. They didn't like a mild judgment day. They didn't like a mild judge. They wanted kids focused not on the presence of Christmas, but instead the rewards at the end of their life. That is, if they were good enough to get into heaven, and more importantly, to avoid an eternal hell. And of course, just like always, the more conspiracy-oriented Christians, you know, those with a little bit of martyrdom racing in their blood, went a little further. Who was responsible for getting rid of Jesus? Who was responsible for oppressing the Christian faith? Where did it all lead? Well, back to the Illuminati, of course. The famous War on Christmas, as we know it today, is, of course, the notion of a concerted effort from liberals to secularize and destroy the Christian part of Christmas, with what else but their rabid political correctness campaign and this nasty little thing called being inclusive. The roots of this conspiracy theory date back to the 1920s, when American tycoon Henry Ford printed widespread articles that accused Jewish people of trying to destroy Christmas for good. As we covered in the Illuminati episode in season one, Ford was the main man behind the popularization of the international Jewish conspiracy, one that claimed that this shadow group, sometimes known as the Illuminati, was trying to take over the United States. In terms of Christmas, Ford asserted in 1921 that, quote, By last Christmas, most people had a hard time finding Christmas cards that indicated in any way that Christmas commemorated someone's birth. Thirty years later, the famous far-right hate group, the John Birch Society, who loved Henry Ford's writings, blamed the hottest scapegoats of the season, you know, the communists. They also blamed the United Nations, who Illuminati conspiracy theorists to this day believe are trying to make the earth a godless heathen paradise for the very rich after a genocide of all good white patriots. In their pamphlet called There Goes Christmas? Question mark, exclamation mark, they called the UN fanatics who aimed to quote, poison the 1959 Christmas season with their high pressure propaganda. The conservative outrage around this new holiday political correctness really got cooking in the 1990s as televangelists and conservative media resurrected and adapted the Illuminati theory for the modern era, led by American hysteria darling, troll televangelist himself, Pat Robertson. But this Yuletide anger was also coming from another writer and magazine editor named Peter Brimelow, who contributed to a far-right website sympathetic to white nationalists called vdare.com. He coined the term the War on Christmas, stating that this conspiracy was, quote, part of the struggle to abolish America. He ran a column that exposed companies and government offices that were bending to the liberal agenda. 
evildoers included the Department of Housing and Urban Development, who disgustingly threw an employee party called, and how dare they, a celebration of holiday traditions. And then Amazon, with no regard for human life, wished their customers happy holidays on their homepage instead of Merry Christmas. Merry, happy holidays. You can say Merry Christmas. Actually, no, I can't. You can bring light and joy to a culture that wants to remove Christ from the season. Watch for this mailing and display your Merry Christmas window cling in your home or car as a witness to keep Christ in Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> yes, it is. Suddenly, American parades began nixing the religious floats. There were a handful of lawsuits that saw Christmas symbols extinguished on government property, nativity scenes taken from public schools, as activists cited the separation of church and state. But conservative activists did not see it that way, with televangelist Pat Buchanan saying, quote, what we are witnessing here are hate crimes against Christianity. Fox News and their now doxxed host, yet another American hysteria darling, Bill O'Reilly, had a regular segment called Christmas Under Siege. And he helped organize boycotts of popular department stores like Sears, Target, and Walmart, and almost all responded to the pressure by reinstating Merry Christmas in 2006, leading tomato-faced chronic victim Bill O'Reilly to declare a temporary victory. Around this same time, an angry woman sent Walmart an email about their use of happy holidays and received this amazing response from a customer service employee. Quote, Santa is also borrowed from the Caucasus, mistletoe from the Celts, Yule log from the Goths, the time from the Visigoth, and the tree from the worship of Baal. It's a wide, wide world. Right away, the Catholic League of Religious and Civil Rights took this as an assault and led yet another boycott, with Walmart immediately firing the fun and daring employee. And then the famous Starbucks cup controversy exploded in 2015, the first year that the chain toned down the Christmas theme to be more inclusive with a simple red cup. Today I read, and I have Starbucks, and my tenants did you read about Starbucks? No more Merry Christmas on Starbucks. No more. I have one of the most successful Starbucks in Trump Tower. Maybe we should boycott Starbucks. I don't know. Seriously. I don't care. But if I become president, we're all going to be saying Merry Christmas again. That I can tell you. That I can tell you. Because Starbucks has become a kind of corporate symbol of mainstream liberal culture, it was a perfect scapegoat to create this apparent Christian oppression that looked more like a simple equality to the rest of us. And then, and then, the very next year, one unsuspecting researcher dared look into the history of a song called Jingle Bells and unwittingly became the new secret agent in the war on Christmas. She had quietly published a peer-reviewed paper called The Story I Must Tell, Jingle Bells in the Minstrel Repertoire. Kina Hamill was interested in figuring out the true origin of the most popular Christmas carol of all time, but she found something different than she expected which I totally relate to. That's right, Jingle Bells was first sung by a white man in blackface at an 1857 Boston minstrel show. Written by a man who also wrote pro-Confederate anthems, James Piermont, Jingle Bells was just one of the many songs he wrote to make money, quote, satirizing black participation in Northern winter activities. Soon, right-wing trolls and then right-wing media went absolutely nuts as they read about her assertions. A Fox News host bleated, Newest Christmas controversy has social justice warriors claiming this classic holiday carol is racist. Now famous right-wing media group Breitbart said that Kina was trying to force America to, quote, shun the jaunty tune. 
In just days, her name became a trending hashtag on Twitter. Cruel and threatening emails poured in, trolls harassed her on Facebook, even calling her at her house. It was confusing because, in reality, Kina hadn't suggested any sort of boycott of Jingle Bells, and she hadn't made any statements about the tune being racist in and of itself, and she certainly didn't say that it should be cancelled for good. She just told the truth of what she found, and that was enough to send people into hysterics, claiming, of course, that they could never be racist, and that it was racist to even suggest that they were racist, as if Kina had ever suggested that in the first place. She was just a simple academic publishing her results. Let's look to another Christmas controversy from 2013, when writer Aisha Harris for Slate wrote an article called Santa Claus Should Not Be a White Man Anymore. The article just adorably suggests that perhaps it's time to turn Santa into something like a penguin so that kids of color don't have to feel left out. Her writing describes her experience of having images of a black Santa Claus at home while everywhere else only seeing a white one. Quote, Eventually I asked my father what Santa really looked like. Was he brown like us or was he really a white guy? My father replied that Santa was every color. Whatever house he visited, jolly old Saint Nicholas magically turned into the likeness of whatever family lived there. Well... Let's see what Megyn Kelly of Fox News had to say about that. And when I saw this headline, I kind of laughed and I said, oh, this is so ridiculous. Yet another person claiming it's racist to have a white Santa, you know? And by the way, for all you kids watching at home, Santa just is white, but this person is just arguing that, that maybe we should, we should also have a black Santa. But you know, Santa is what he is. And just so you know, we're just debating this because someone wrote about it, kids. Just because it makes you feel uncomfortable doesn't mean it has to change. You know, I mean, yeah. Jesus was a white man too, but you, you know, it's like, we have, he was a historical figure. I mean, that's a verifiable fact, as is Santa. I just want right. the kids watching to know that. Well, okay. And then when the first report went online about Mall of America's decision to employ their very first black Santa, the very first black Santa in America, the Minneapolis Star Tribune had to close their comment section almost immediately after horrific racist comments and complaints about reverse racism began to saturate the article. Peter Morgan of CBS Minnesota went as far as calling for a boycott, writing, quote, stupid, incredibly stupid, Santa is white, boycott Mall of America. Maybe they should change their name to Mall of Raghead Land. Oof. Of course, uh, it's an interesting irony considering the real birthplace of Jesus in the Middle East. But that Jesus does not match the American status quo or American politics. Of course, Santa's is a white man. Of course, Jesus is a white man. Of course, God himself is a white man. It's laughable and apparently it's offensive to consider it any other way. Even if history tells a different story of a poor infant born in a manger in modern day Palestine. More after this. And now, back to the show. Now that we get a sense of this ongoing desire in some American minds to keep a kind of pure white Christmas, we can also see a parallel outrage in the language used around the conspiracy theory called the gay agenda. Though not Christmas-specific, our next excerpt will show that fundamentalist activists have been quite vocal about their assertion of an organized gay Illuminati coming to upend American traditions and the traditional American family. Just by being witnessed, Queer people have been seen as an extreme threat to the next generation, which is why there's always been a vested interest in keeping us hidden. The Hallmark Channel has waited until the last possible cultural second to include gay characters in their movies, 
often citing a desire to stay apolitical and family-friendly, implying that our existence must by virtue be political, and that same existence cannot be family-friendly. Ouch! Now, here's an excerpt from The Gay Agenda that will teach us the history of this conspiracy theory that has had real consequences that continue to this very day. Take a listen. As we learn with the Satanic Panic, fundamentalists had long been on the hunt for these indoctrinating forces in children's entertainment. Take this quote from a 1987 essay called The Cereal Box Conspiracy Against the Developing Mind that says of a Barbie breakfast cereal, The image of a scantily clad Barbie showing lots of plastic flesh might be just the ideal breakfast companion for the developing heterosexual boy. The result of this may be to confuse the young boy's sexual orientation, and this may be welcomed by food manufacturers, for market surveys have found gay men to be more avid shoppers than their hetero counterparts. Maybe you'll also recall my favorite guy from the mid-1980s, Phil Phillips, who wrote Turmoil in the Toy Box, all about satanic cartoons and toys. Well, he also charged the Smurfs with being a homosexual commune and Smurfette with being a transgender woman. And then we can go back even further to 1954, when a psychologist named Frederick Wortham published his book called Seduction of the Innocent, about the dangers of comic books on the minds of the young. Can you guess who Wortham outed? None other than that beefcake Batman and his twinky sidekick Robin, pointing to several apparent examples that proved a gay subtext, showing what appeared to be a secret sexual relationship between the heroes. Wonder Woman was presented as a kind of militant feminist lesbian with scores of young female concubines. According to Wortham, the Batman and Wonder Woman type story could stimulate children into homosexual fantasies, endangering their normal heterosexual futures as members of their respective nuclear families, and because of that, threatening the entire social order and even American capitalism and democracy itself. Make no mistake. These deviants seek no less than total control and influence in society, politics, our schools, and in our exercise of free speech and religious freedom. If we do not act now, homosexuals will own America. That was Jerry Falwell again. If you remember our episode on the Illuminati, some of this stuff is going to sound suspiciously familiar. The gay agenda conspiracy theory uses a similar template, flipping the script so that the oppressed become the oppressors. This is well represented by a controversy that exploded in New York City in the mid-90s over a multicultural curriculum designed to help foster a sense of understanding between students of different cultures. This included a small section of advice to educators and parents that they teach their students simply that gay people exist and deserve respect. But the president of District 24's board called the guide, quote, dangerously misleading lesbian homosexual propaganda and accused the chancellor of perpetuating, quote, as big a lie as any concocted by Hitler or Stalin, likely referencing the pink swastika written in 1995, which claimed that homosexuals had, in fact, not been targeted during Nazi Germany's reign and that instead, Hitler and the other high-ranking Nazis were all gay men themselves mirroring the kind of Holocaust denial that says that Jews are faking their oppression to posture as victims. A lot of this got started back in 1948 when psychologist Alfred Kinsey published the results of his research into homosexual behavior, which said that one in ten people were gay and that gay men did not have to appear effeminate and gay women did not have to appear masculine. In fact, more often than not, they didn't, meaning that there was no way to outwardly tell the difference. The common conception of homosexuality at the time was that it was essentially contagious and one could be influenced into the lifestyle and, on the flip side, influenced out of it. In 1952, scientists bolstered these religious fears when psychologists named homosexuality a pathology and it was listed under the banner of sociopathic personality deviation. 
Though an improvement to it being seen as a criminal offense, the mental illness angle is where we see conversion therapies begin, with the intent of converting homosexuals back to heterosexuality, with the most extreme examples being neurologist Walter Freeman, who used ice pick lobotomies to cure almost 1,500 homosexuals, and most of those he operated on, with no formal training by the way, were left severely disabled for the rest of their lives. Other forms of conversion therapy last to this day and have included forced hospitalizations and electroshock therapy. This idea that gay people were more common and more hidden than the nation previously knew led to this feeling that homosexuals could be this kind of invisible agent. Suddenly, everyone was a suspect and everyone was vulnerable. In the 1950s, the TV dinner buttoned up, family-obsessed American Pleasantville was shot through with a chilling Cold War paranoia, the threat of the Soviet Union and its spies. At the beginning of the decade, Senator Joseph McCarthy started what is now called the Red Scare, leading a witch hunt for a supposed spy ring of communists in positions of influence, as well as whoever fit his own agenda, like black civil rights leaders, left-wing protesters, university professors, and Hollywood actors. McCarthy also led another purge, a lesser known but even more devastating panic called the Lavender Scare, in which the FBI fired 425 suspected gay men and women from U.S. government employment. They did this, they said, because these, quote, sexual perverts were susceptible to blackmail by the communists. McCarthy also intimidated those who spoke out against him by threatening to out them as homosexuals, and often said explicitly to reporters, If you want to be against McCarthy, boys, you gotta be either a communist or a cocksucker. From here, this fear of the homosexual shifted into something more actively sinister, when, yet again, conservatives didn't get the gay joke. Anti-gay groups freaked out over the discovery of a collective of artists from the 1930s that called themselves the Hominturn, a joke name inspired by a communist term called the Comintern, an organization who wanted to spread communism to the West. The Hominturn, however, was just a friendly gathering of queer artists and writers who had a pipe dream of living open lives and helping others to live them too. But to those embroiled in Cold War anxiety, the existence of a Hominturn signaled none other than, quote, an international homosexual conspiracy that mirrored the communist one, with the single goal of destroying traditional American values. Three years after the Lavender Scare, President Eisenhower would sign an executive order which barred homosexuals from working for the federal government. Approximately 5,000 gay people were forcibly outed and fired from federal employment, including those in the military. In addition, many public school teachers lost their jobs and many were publicly outed. These actions certainly forced gay folks deeper into the closet, but nonetheless, they continued to find ways to find each other. When we talk about returning America to its former greatness, the term is almost always referring to the 1950s, this decade after the frightening chaos of World War II, when everyone lived under the constant Cold War threat of nuclear annihilation, and everyone just kind of wanted to live in a sculpted commercial cheerfulness. But the stirrings of feminism, of gay visibility, and of the Black civil rights movement were being perceived as domestic threats to the sanctity of the white Christian family, an increasing number of whom were fleeing the cities to new segregated neighborhoods in the suddenly affordable suburbs. But when these boundaries were breached by those who did not belong, it showed that under the facades of these mass-produced houses, under the smile and the wink of some upstanding families, was the shockingly cruel enforcement of what was called a, quote, private haven in a heartless world where parents wouldn't have to worry. You know, family friendly. Here's the excerpt from our episode called Suburbia. It's a rough one, so keep that in mind. 
As we've talked about before, World War II produced a devastating emotional state for the collective nation, and the huge influx of soldiers returning home wanted the things they'd been dreaming about. Love, marriage, children, stability, and happiness. Groundwork for a new solution had been laid by famous architect Frank Lloyd Wright, a man with a disdain for the city and a great appreciation of nature, as well as cheap production. He started having a vision he called Usonia, a combination of USA and Utopia. But it wasn't until the sudden influx of shaken soldiers returning from Europe that there became an urgent need for affordable luxury housing. And in 1947, a man named William Levitt seemed to have a kind of mass solution, an extension of that idea, and he would go on to become the father of the manicured suburbia as we know it today. Using Henry Ford's assembly line structure, Levitt came up with a plan to create neighborhoods in what is now modern-day Long Island. He wanted to do so quickly, efficiently, and, of course, as cheaply as possible. His vision represents the pop culture images we've absorbed of suburbia, identical houses side by side, each with the same appliances. 750 square feet, two bedrooms, a living room, a kitchen, and a bathroom. No basements, no garages. They didn't have time for that. Levitt kept the prices low enough so that young couples could afford a down payment and move in immediately, and that was a good thing, as the morning before the Levitt town homes went on sale, people had actually camped out in front of his office. And by morning, there was a line of 1,500 families gathered and waiting. But everyone in that line was white, one of the cardinal rules of this new suburban life. Levitt Town called itself a, quote, private haven in a heartless world where parents wouldn't have to worry. Here, they were safe just like they were safe on the outskirts of a burned-out Chicago. Here, everything was straightforward, clear in its boundaries, clear in its traditions, and clear in its rules. With these segregated islands, only really accessible by the luxury of a car, suburbia was slowly becoming a white middle-class haven, away from the crime, poverty, black people, and immigrants. And this is Levittown. Here you can own your own home, complete with its own refrigerator, television set, and clothes dryer. You can raise your children far from the city's dirt, crowding, and crime, in comfort and safety. It became a way of starting to forget the horrors of war and extreme poverty, of ignoring the terrifying and looming threat of nuclear war, and of forgetting the problems that still plagued the poor residents of the city as they sat drinking lemonade on the lawn. By 1957, the Levitt town in Pennsylvania had unknowingly become home to its first black residents, the Myers family, made up of a young couple and their three children. Former Pennsylvanian William Myers was a World War II Army veteran, now an engineer, and Daisy Myers had obtained a bachelor's degree in education. This black family had reached the middle class, and as they appeared suddenly walking into the front door of 43 Deep Green Lane in the Dogwood Hollow, shocked men grew increasingly angry. Women touched their tight faces and said, quote, Oh my, they are here. Can you believe it? The first news report followed soon after, when the Bucks County Courier Times reported, quote, the first Negro family to buy a home in Levittown. But Levitt didn't know anything about it, and he wanted to know how they managed to move in without his knowledge. It turned out that a previous owner had sold his house to the Myers over the phone, and it's likely that he did not ask Mr. Myers to disclose his race. Their family did not fly under the radar, as they hoped that they might, and within hours of the Bucks County article, a crowd was forming outside their house. They stayed late into the night, yelling, intimidating, threatening, with teenagers throwing rocks through their front window. The cop arrived to break up the mob around 12.30 a.m., with the sheriff asking desperately for backup from the state police 
telling them that, quote, the citizens of Levittown are out of control. The violent intimidation only escalated, and eventually a mob headed over to Walt Disney Elementary School, where someone had lit an eight-foot bamboo cross on fire. Soon after, a coalition of 500 was formed that they called the Levittown Betterment Committee, whose mission was to remove the Myers family by any legal means necessary. In an emotional blow to the veteran William Myers, these meetings were held at the Veteran of Foreign Affairs post. Eventually, after many weeks, after another cross was burned at a local elementary school and many mobs had stood outside the modest ranch house, the Myers were no longer plagued with a constant crowd of racists yelling at their house at all hours, but they still received constant threats, with one neighbor hoisting a Confederate flag, blaring Old Man River constantly, day and night, through a loudspeaker. The Myers family would live in Levittown four more years before finally deciding to move back to Pennsylvania. More after this. And now, back to the show. Now that we've heard a little history about the war on Christmas, the gay agenda conspiracy theory, and the traditional greatness of early suburbia, we can see that there are plenty of factors weighing in on Hallmark's struggle with hashtag diversity as they navigate their primarily conservative audience's values. As the culture war rages, some of us have become symbols of the stress in this increasingly polarized country, something that many would rather just not have to think about. It makes sense, then, that adults might turn to the sugary comforts of a simplistic romance, of a family not fractured by their beliefs, of a most special day of the year when magic might truly be possible. Here is a little section from The War on Christmas to close us out. As the century reached its end, a wave of scientific discoveries like the light bulb and the telephone began to shake the foundations of a devoutly Christian nation. They could see that the magic of technology was anything but, and after people began moving into cities in huge numbers, they met people very different from them, and they began to explore possibilities outside of their strict Christian morality. But the older generation was resolute in their commitment to the unseen, and they began to need children to just believe in something. Just like today, kids had questions. In a famous letter to the editor of the New York Sun, this desire to believe was made clear. An apparent little girl named Virginia had written a letter that was answered by veteran journalist Francis Church in what would become the most reprinted newspaper article of all time. It went like this. Dear editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there's no Santa Claus. Papa says, if you see it in the sun, it's so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? And here is Francis's response. Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. All minds, Virginia, whether they be men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant in his intellect, as compared with the boundless world around him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole truth and knowledge. You may tear apart the baby's rattle and see what makes the noise inside, but there is a veil covering the unseen world, which not the strongest man, nor even the united strength of all the strongest men that ever lived, could tear apart. Only faith, fancy, poetry, love, romance can push aside that curtain and view and picture the supernatural beauty and glory beyond. 
Thank you so much for listening to this Context Clues episode. And please tune in next week for our episode called Hallmark Christmas Movies. In the meantime, we encourage you to listen to our full episode of The War on Christmas, The Gay Agenda, and Suburbia. And you've still got some time to burn through a few of these mushy, mass-produced masterpieces. God knows our brains have long turned to cookie dough. And we hope you'll enjoy the treats of our labor jollily once they are fully baked. This was American Hysteria's Context Clues. If you love our show, listen. We could really use your support by leaving us a five-star review on the app of your choosing. No, listen, you could really do it right now. It only takes a second, and it really helps so much. You can also join our Patreon for early ad-free episodes and our extra show called Hysteria Home Companion, where producer Miranda Zickler and I talk about all the juiciest stuff that didn't make it into the topic. Just head to patreon.com slash American Hysteria. This episode was edited by Riley Swedelius smith and produced by me, Chelsea Weber-Smith. Thanks, as always, for listening, and make sure you come back next week to learn all about the history of Hallmark Christmas movies. Have yourself a jolly-ass week.